Welcome to the X11 Metaverse Web3 and Digital Art Podcast. Today we sat down with Jess Knatzer, a prominent curator in the digital art and Web3 world. Jess, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm so excited to have you here. Do you want to maybe quickly introduce yourself, say a few sentences about you and your background? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Jess Knatzer. I am an independent curator and the founder of Studio As We Are. Um, primarily, my work aims to really uh, support um, and cultivate voices in crypto art space and new media art space. Uh, we're really focused on uh, accessibility, public art exhibitions, um, and special projects. And we collaborate a lot with art fairs and galleries, uh, now institutions, which is very exciting and um, brands when it makes sense. Uh, and we're, you know, really Web3 curious and super into that and working with as many artists in the NFT space as possible, but also maintaining um, an eye on like a traditional digital, digital art space as much as possible as well, because I think that there's many ways to collect digital art and live with digital art. Um, and that's something that we always want to be mindful about and continue to explore as we move into these new spaces <laughs> that are still yet to be determined. Cool. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited. Like, I have so many questions to ask you. Um, so first off, when I was uh, doing some research on you, your bio mentioned that you were self-taught. So I was wondering, how did you start your journey to becoming a curator? And what did you do before? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, so I studied initially like advertising and marketing communications, also uh, museum studies and art history. Um, I was in New York City uh, at the time. I had no clue what I wanted to do, um, but always kind of gravitated towards uh, creativity, uh, artistry, fashion, design, um, and was fascinated by those who like were just kind of absolutely knew what they wanted to do. Uh, and I found that artists were a good example to kind of uh, at least work alongside or or work with because they were, in my opinion, so brave because they were able to express themselves and just like put their work out there um, in a way that was almost like uninhibited. And I, I wanted to learn how to do that. So I found myself working with um, various like uh, photography studios and um, also just like small agencies and things like that. I actually started my career at Milk Studios um, in uh, like 2011 in New York City. And at the time, um, I, I kind of got all my jobs because of Twitter. I would tweet at people and connect with them. And, you know, next, like, next thing I knew one thing led to another and I was meeting, you know, great contacts. And um, so I, I actually got jobs um, uh, initially in social media uh, at these companies um, in the early days when companies were still just kind of like, do we get on Twitter? Do we you know, have a blog, like, what does this mean? Like, is it good for us? So on and so forth. And so I really um, was able to kind of convince a lot of like art centric studios and spaces that yes, like social media was the future. You needed to do that, you know, to build your community. Um, and because of that, I got really involved with um, uh, collaborating with artists and, um, different creatives on, on basically just re reaching new audiences to market a space or, um, you know, an event or promote something. And, and that's kind of like how all of this started. Um, one of my first big memories of like really kind of getting more into the digital art space was probably around 2013. I worked on a project while at Milk Studios with um, Tumblr and Paddle 8 uh, and Smartwater called Moving the Still. It's like the first ever gift museum that we kind of collaboratively developed uh, in Miami for Art Basel. So things like that were just kind of like coming at me and I got to meet a lot of these like digital creators that at the time were called digital creators were being th thought of as like artists 
um, you know, maybe people would be generous and call them like gift makers or something like that. And it's kind of, <laughs> you know, hilarious, the gift days, um, but really inspiring to me and really cool because it started to create uh, ideas for me to kind of understand like how to better communicate online with audiences and different people and and really reach them you know with content that was like native to that space um, rather than trying to repurpose something like in the real world that didn't necessarily make sense to kind of uh you know attract that sort of audience so uh, i after kind of understanding that that like i said sparks so many different um artist collaborations uh from there um like after working at milk for like four years and working with a lot of like emerging artists, musicians. Uh, we did Fashion Week. Main Fashion Week was a huge thing back then. So we had like a fashion program with digital artists who would come in. I don't know if you guys remember like Fuzzy Guy by like John McLaughlin. Um, things like that. <laughs> it was really fun. Uh, Chantel Martin used to do a lot of stuff with us at the studio. It was really, really cool. But I moved on to Noya House. Um, which is kind of like a Soho house. I don't know if you guys know Noi, but really great kind of um, membership space that specializes in uh, um, a lot of like uh, cultural programming. And so from there, I really started to kind of uh, realize that, you know, taking all of this information about artists, collaborations, and online community building, and then applying that to like in real life, um, cultural programming events and, you know, developing content in a new way because of the way that Noya House is known for their programming, um, then built on that experience of, okay, let's add in some education. Let's add in like these other thought leaders that are more established and start to really kind of um, uh, get into a more like serious like groove with um, uh, interviews and uh, various projects, again, that were um, just like much bigger, I guess, or more prominent at the time in the art world. Um, and so all of these types of experiences really kind of informed like where I am now. But again, it took me ages to figure this out that like developing content, doing editorial um, marketing and promotions or brand collaborations and things like that. Like I really had to understand what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, and ultimately, I discovered that uh, what I was doing, while it was great, my favorite part about it was working with artists. Um, artist relations were um, my favorite part of all of this, developing that content, but then also just like appreciating the work that these artists were doing and also working really hard to be an advocate with like for the artists when working with other brands because at the time, branded content was like the thing. And I felt that brands were like stripping away creativity from the artists to make it fit into the work that they needed um, to like support their brand. And I, I absolutely like became sickened by that and was just like, this is unfair. This is not right. Like artists need to be who they are um, and should have permission to do so. And if you want to work with an artist and put their name on something, then they need to be able to create from an authentic place. So that really kind of moved me into this very like uh, big kind of mindset of just like okay no more working with brands um let's let's like start collaborating collaborating with artists if we do work with brands like it's got to be super super clear that they can you know um be a patron of the arts they can support the arts but they're not going to like metal with the art itself it needs to maintain its purity um things like that uh, i also was working a lot then with absolute art which was um absolute vodka's uh like art platform or, and or sister company that worked um to make uh ex like basically um, artworks by huge artists found in institutions and things like that uh, to develop like museum quality prints that were accessible um, just for, you know, anyone who like wanted to collect art but didn't know where to start. So that also kind of spurred this sort of like idea of, okay, I love working with artists. I, I love accessibility. I love public art. 
I don't want people to, you know, develop a storyline that's not true to the, the artist that I'm working with. Like, what does this mean? How can I like explore this more? And how do I make a career out of this? And that's when Absolute Art started getting me to curate things and everything kind of clicked from there. Um, <laughs> so long winded, I'm sorry, that was like a little out of order, but for the most part, it was just kind of like a very happy accident, but also was something that I had been like, essentially like educating myself on and or getting real world experience um through uh just the people I was working with so many talented you know creative directors and uh thought leaders and things like that who then kind of just really helped support me and saw like what I was good at and pushed me in that direction to you know explore curation to explore what it meant to work more with artists directly like how to price art, how to think about display, how to think about like what art should look like in a gallery space versus someone's home, like things like that just really started becoming my focus. I think one of my old bosses used to call me like look and feel girl. So because she's like, you make everything look beautiful. So it was just like this really funny, like natural kind of, um, I guess, uh, you know, moment that just it, it happened but also became very intentional over time as well um and it, it's just like you know we'll and we'll get to your other questions but <laughs> so i'll stop sorry like i will go on tangents so you can feel free to cut me off by the way oh like, no problem that was really great that was amazing uh, please go on tangent <laughs> <laughs> yeah please it's so interesting that kind of leads me to um want to know more about studio as we are at like as it is today and specifically like how did you come up with the name sure. and... so i came up with studio as we are in like 2017 i actually i i had created like a web like name for my um google home in my apartment called jess as we are for some reason like i don't know a decade or so ago and um kind of like became super aware <laughs> of the fact that like uh, in my career, I personally needed to stop like trying to people please and do what other people like expected of me all the time and like say what they wanted me to say. And it's just like, you know, I became aware of like needing to have my own opinion, especially if I wanted to be a curator, um, because that's what we're supposed to do. We really need to like have that leadership. We need to really help develop um, uh, what like how we're contextualizing the art and being that intermediary between, you know, the artist and the public and, you know, the institution or gallery or whatever space we're working with to then present that art. So I wanted like at the time to, um, it, it, I guess it started kind of as like a self-help project or like a self-care project where I was giving myself permission to essentially like be myself in that moment, like, as we are and then also trying or as I am and also trying to then give that same permission to other people who are working with me so that we could be more intentional att intentional about our work and develop something a bit more authentic um, uh, when we would come together to do that but then also being mindful of the fact that we evolve and we change and so we are as we are at any given moment in time and and that became very important to me and also was very much inspired by the artists that I work with because I found that artists were so incredibly true to themselves or would use their work to figure out how to be true to themselves. And so for me, it just was this like very kind of holistic um, way to be. And if I, I felt that if I named my studio that or named my work projects underneath that kind of... Um, uh, name or framework it would I would like eventually just embody that idea and be that you know individual um but also uh be able to work with people in a way that allowed them to then give that back to me because I think that's what we need to do something special and that's what we need to actually like figure out um in a I guess calm and or non sort of like uh what am i looking for 
I like way that in a way that isn't influenced again by what we think we need to do or what we think we need to say and rather share what we personally feel that we need to share um because I think again that's when magic happens when it comes to projects and collaborations so that's kind of um where that came from <laughs> so it, it again it's super personal but then ended up taking on its own entire form I love that and um I actually just hearing the name studio as we are, there's something so almost therapeutic about it. So like true to your nature, like that's kind of before we even ask that question, that's sort of what I interpreted it as. Oh, cool. So it's, it's really amazing. And um, yeah, I'm really inspired by your story and I can totally see how all of your previous jobs and all the decisions you made have brought you to, to work in this field and um, to be so involved in digital art and representing artists and artist relations. So that leads me to the next question. So, okay, I know that you're a very prominent person when it comes to, you know, digital art and Web3. So I was just wondering if it was, let's say, 1960s and digital art and Web3 didn't exist, do you think you would still want to be a curator? Would you still be drawn to that? Or are you interested in it because of, um, you know, the freedom that Web3 could offer? Like, what is your take on that? Well, I think it, you know, technically digital art was happening in the 1960s. It wasn't really necessarily like a term that was used until what the 80s. But I, I like, you know, I don't know. I, I've always been fascinated by the computer um, and by technology and, uh, you know, different kind of, you know, platforms that help you communicate with others. And uh, I think I, I probably would have found my way in to that space um if you would have like point blank asked me if I wanted to be a curator like I don't know if I could have answered that question like unless you know today yes the answer is absolutely yes but maybe a decade ago I would have been like what are you talking about like I don't I don't know so I think that yeah to me now knowing what I do know and knowing that I I only know a little bit and there's so much more I want to learn um I would have been fascinated, I think, to, to be involved. And yes, I love the freedom and like where, what we've like found today, but the history of it all and um, how it started is also like fascinating. And I am excited by new technology. So I think I would have still been excited by this then in some capacity. Oh, great. Amazing. That makes me think like we were kind of the first generation to grow up with computers uh -huh. in the home and grow up with the internet. And now we have smartphones in our pocket that are like more powerful than really people ever had before. And so I'm wondering, uh, are there moments that you can remember growing up where you kind of like clicked or you could see kind of led you to this path? Um. Yeah, I, you know, it's something I actually think about all the time, um, just because I'm like, how did, how did I get here, right? And why am I so weird? Why am I doing this work? It's so funny. But I did, I, I actually spent tons and tons of time, like, as a kid playing, like, Nintendo 64, Zelda was, like, one of my favorite games, GoldenEye. Like, I literally had to be peeled away from the computer because I was obsessed with Diablo. I don't know if you guys know that game, but really oh, yeah, nerdy and would spend hours yeah. and hours on that. Um, I also uh, spent tons of time um, in AOL chat rooms, like ASL. Favorite, favorite thing to do. Loved meeting random people. Also was grounded for doing that constantly. So again, just like I had this like separate life on AOL, on the computer with people. <laughs> that I would randomly meet. Um, I also became like the go-to person for MySpace backgrounds. I would like li literally manipulate the HTML and just like change the picture for people. So I like would charge people like three to five dollars when I was a kid for that shit. Wow. So wow. things like that um, definitely kind of, I think makes sense for like why I'm so like try like constantly trying to um, connect through like computer um, related art or initiatives or whatever 
Um, I also, like, I guess, too, I loved the computer because I didn't have to speak to people when I was a kid. If I was using, like, with my voice, I, I actually had a, like, really bad lisp when I was younger. So I was so embarrassed to, <laughs> like, communicate in real life. So the computer was um, kind of like a safe haven for me. And so I, I sought like refuge with the computer and was able to like figure out how to talk to people and like how to connect to people without them like asking me to say Christmas. I'm not even kidding. So it was like really funny. Um, so that was, um, yeah, those are just like little things that come up. Um, and then I guess the other thing that would kind of like bring it all together too is um, I was fascinated and this kind of goes back to AOL a little bit too, but fascinated by people who came from literally anywhere else in the world besides America. Um, I, I like knew I wanted to travel, but I was more stagnant like in the States when I was younger. So I made a point of like befriending anyone who was an exchange student or like couldn't really speak English. Um, and I think like that has also kind of followed me throughout my life because global initiatives and like large scale projects that connect people all over the world is something that I always try to infuse into my projects. So, um, I, yeah, so there's all those like little seeds almost, uh, that kind of like, if you kind of follow them, um, maybe like got me here. Okay. But they all go back to Tom from my Yes. Space. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Yes. Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he was such a creep. So good. I think I spent a long time trying to see if I could, like, delete him as a friend. Like, <laughs> could you delete him as a I friend? I think you just had to yeah, have him. He, like, as a made. He, like, that's <laughs> major narcissism. It's like a hostage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really funny. Oh my gosh. Oh, never forget MySpace Tom. It's funny. I totally relate to everything you said. And I actually learned a bit about HTML code in high school because I wanted to customize my MySpace profile. <laughs> That's great. So, That's so it's great. amazing. Like intro to coding yeah. was just so I can, you know, embed a music video into my profile that everyone has to listen to whether they like it or not. And it's so funny. And, um, yeah, this is, uh, it leads me to the next question I wanted to ask you, which we already kind of touched upon, but what are some of your memories or, or stories of experiencing online communities before they were called the metaverse? Ooh, yeah, gosh, that's interesting. Cause, um, I mean, I guess it just, again, like AOL really is just like the random, like what place to connect and get people together. Um, or the OG space, at least in my opinion. I'm, I'm sure there's like nerdier people out there than me because I don't think I got as nerdy as some people I know did in this kind of sphere in like the 2000s. But then I guess the next kind of like iteration of that for me that just really pulled me in again was like Twitter. I was like obsessed with tweeting at people like back in the early days. If you kind of like scroll back into my feed, you'll kind of really see where that all happened and when it started in like 2007. So yeah, that, that was kind of like where I, um, uh, would, I guess, congregate digitally and like try to get everyone else to congregate there. And, or like, that's where I met my friends, literally. <laughs> on Twitter. On Twitter. <laughs> and, and, wow. and got my jobs, by the way. So, yeah. That's amazing. That's such a success story for Twitter. It's, it's pretty <laughs> funny. But then I ended up, like, not looking at Twitter for ages again, and Instagram became the thing. And so it's super funny to go back to Twitter, and I, like, don't have the same sort of love affair with it as I used to. So it's, like, trying to learn Twitter all over, over again is hilarious. So... Yeah, anyway. No, that's awesome. I mean, I was more of a Habbo Hotel person. I don't know if any of you remember Habbo Hotel. I don't. What is that? It was, it was like kind of a metaverse before. Do you think, does it ring a bell? No, I was just, you just, I just realized that maybe the Sims <laughs> were my metaverse. Oh, yeah. I was obsessed with the oh Sims, my gosh. you know, like. Yes. Stacy definitely. Mom. 
Oh, so I was going to say, Stacey definitely no- owes her whole career to The Sims. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm definitely <laughs> yeah. a 3D artist <laughs> before, because of The Sims. Like, I found out about it, I think, in grade five, and I was just so obsessed with it. And my mom would actually have to, like, peel me away from the computer and be like, can you socialize with someone in real life? Like, you're making your Sim learn how to paint. Like, why don't you just learn <laughs> how to paint? So funny. <laughs> I, like, learned all the cheat codes and just, like, kept giving myself more money and then, like, just would build, oh, yeah. like, crazy complexes and then, like, make my Sims die, which is really weird. I, like, <laughs> have no idea why I would do that, but... We've all done that. <laughs> like, I've drowned them in the pool. <laughs> Been there, done that. Uh, anyway, sorry. Tell me because I, I just you. I was like, oh yeah, The Sims. I also wasted uh, so much of my life on that game. It's not a waste. I feel like that game taught me so much True. of what I know. Like it taught me about life. <laughs> totally. Totally. <laughs> Funny. Uh, it's so good. All right. So just to kind of change uh, topics a bit, we're just curious how you got started working with Kadaf. Sure. Yeah, I actually I had this um, uh, experiential series with Lightbox in like 2019 um, called Decode Experiential. And we would essentially invite like artists and industry professionals, um, digital artists specifically, industry professionals working like in the exp- experiential or digital art space to come and speak about like experiential, what it meant, how it could be better, um, how we hated like ball pits. And if we saw another one, we were going to die, that kind of thing. And also allow for the artists to like show their work in an experiential space, like while talking about their work and not making it just like another like weird thing that a brand hired someone to do that wasn't like indicative to them or their art at all, going back to the branding stuff. So we did this series like monthly for a year um, in 2019 before the pandemic and like everything happened, which that's a whole nother situation. Um, And during that time, um, we actually like uh, met Elena and uh, Andrea from Kadaf and invited them to be one of our speakers. Uh, They also hosted the first like Kadaf um, New York at Lightbox. And so we did speaking engagements there with them. And yeah, I guess I, we kept in touch and, uh, I started just doing more and more projects with them over time. And it was just like a really, um, wonderful, like click. And also we found that we had very similar missions, um, to one another. And uh, I really respected like their backgrounds, where they came from and like really looked at their their platform as a place to grow and to learn and to connect with like a larger like more OG like digital art crew which definitely happened um so that was like a it was really exciting kind of like happy accident that you know we all kind of were doing these things at the same time and yeah so that was the initial sort of meet cute if you will but amazing Yeah, I I really love working with Kadaf as well. You know, they have a really powerful platform as well. And it seems like they really help artists to connect with maybe some of the more OG um, crowd who maybe are still learning about digital art and NFTs. So totally. it's like a really nice bridge. Yeah, so um, let's talk about your amazing exhibition, Women of the World, that I was lucky enough to take part in. It was so cool. So can you tell us more about how that all happened? And sure. your amazing curatorial decision, very unique. Tell us about <laughs> okay. it. Well, I can't really take full credit for that one. Like that was, I, I have to give Roxy Fata from Infinite Objects like a major plug there because this was really like her brainchild. She really wanted to create something super unique and special. Um, I definitely came in and was like, oh, woman, because like I have like this very big like, kind of um, feminist bone inside my body, which is something I've realized over the last like five or so years. It's always been there, but it's like, you know, getting a lot stronger. Um, And so we really kind of, uh, like it was very exciting. I work a lot with Infinite Objects and I I love what they do when it comes to like making, you know, digital art 
that much more accessible and understandable to like your average human who like might not understand how to collect something they see on Instagram all the time um, that they otherwise think of as just like snackable content or something like squishy and or satisfying to look at depending on, you know, again, like what your average person sees. So when they kind of opened their doors in what, like 2018, I, I jumped all over that because to have a digital object that people could hold and be like, oh, like I get it. Like I can own a video um, was huge. So I've been pretty like loyal and wanting to work with them um, as much as possible since they created their, their, uh, uh, their brand and their company and, and love everything they do. So yeah, so I have to plug Roxy there, but uh, yeah, so we kind of, we came together to develop um, Women of the World and it was really something that we wanted to do in the sense that like, you know, Roxy was like, look, we need to like tell a larger story here about where all of these, like where the population really is and, and let's like weight this by, you know, um, global population based on you know, continents and, and whatnot, which then positioned this this um, exhibition to actually have more artists from Asia and Africa than anywhere else, which is really cool because it's just something that we're always hearing that there's not enough room or not enough artists that are diverse in, in lots of these various projects that are happening at any given time. And I think all of us kind of wanted to like make a point that there's plenty of artists from all over the world. Um, and if you look for them, you will find them. And so with this project, uh, we were able to reach um, over 130 women identifying artists from all over the world, again, weighted by population per continent and bring them together to showcase their artwork uh, during this special kind of moment for NFT NYC, which was awesome because beyond it just being a, an amazing gallery show um it happened during a time where we had a lot of eyeballs and, and a lot of opportunity for people to explore and see the power of infinite objects but the power of women artists globally and like what nfts are doing um for the community because you know the fact that we were able to pull this project together like in a month or so like i don't know like maybe six weeks uh, was huge and also just like um, a major kind of uh, like moment to look back at what Web3 is actually doing, what NFTs are actually doing um, when it comes to community building and connection, right? Like there's so much more opportunity because these platforms are open. You can see people who are like basically self-publishing or minting their work and you can find them. Um, much more readily. And so anyone who says that you can't is not doing their research, isn't doing their homework, and isn't, um, you know, looking hard enough. Because again, like, there's no reason why you can't um, have a more diverse group project happening at any given time. Like, the NFT space is making it that much easier to, to pull these, you know, people together. And so um, I think, that's just, again, something that was really important for us to kind of like showcase. Uh, and then from that, like we've created a very beautiful group of, of, you know, artists that have come together under this like, you know, power of divine feminism who now are friends and now like collaborate and talk to each other on a regular basis. And the community is growing and there's so many more projects that are happening, um, including the video print collection that we just launched with these same artists. Um, so it's, yeah, it's been really magical to, to partake in this and to meet everyone. And again, to hear everyone's like different stories because based on where they are in the world, uh, it really does inform like who they are and how they create their work and what they think about their work. And there's been like a lot of continuity from piece to piece based on, you know, the stories that we hear on Twitter spaces and what they write, you know, about their artwork and whatnot, which, wasn't necessarily what I thought was going to happen at the beginning. So it was really, really cool to see that there was like a gigantic common thread, even though everybody comes from somewhere else. So, um, yeah, it was, it's been a beautiful project to continue continuously work on.
Yeah, that was a really, really beautiful project. And I really enjoyed listening to uh, the different artists. Like I, I tuned into a few of the Twitter talks, Twitter spaces, and I just loved hearing from the artists, especially from the, there's some very emerging artists in that group. And uh, it was really fun hearing about, you know, them being approached by, by you and, and <laughs> you know, other people on the team. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the it. The DMs. They were like, is this a oh, scam? Yeah. I was just like, I was really, laughing. Really funny. I was, I was definitely laughing when I heard that. I know. I can't help it. I'm, so I good. stay true to my AOL roots. I just laugh. <laughs> yes. Just OG. That kind of thing. <laughs> It really reminds me of what you were saying earlier about being really fascinated with people from all mm -hmm. over the world. And it's something that I've been really enjoying for the last several years where you can really almost have a, a relationship with people through their content and learn more about the world. Like even just watching different YouTube creators from, di from Africa or different parts of the world. And then really, because we live in our own little bubble, yeah. it's really easy to just stay in that bubble but when you get to see the world through someone else's eyes, it really like opens your your mind to like new possibilities and new ways of looking at things. Well, it, it's huge. And sure. it also just creates like the ability to just be a better human, in my opinion, because you can be understanding of one another in a much bigger way if you just like get to know people and their culture and how they think about things. You know, it, it might be different from what you grew up with, but it doesn't mean that it's not like just as beautiful or just as interesting or just as like meaningful or something. So I, I think, you know, making more space to connect with people and to really like listen to them and learn about who they are is huge. And our society in general needs to do more of that. So it's just like something that I like to create awareness around, but also when you do things, when you create projects like this, I think you start to low key create like resources too for everyone um, because of the connections and the opportunities for them, for people who are looking to, you know, get to the next level in their career or spark new ideas, um, can then access over time. So that is another big thing too. It's like, if I am able to do these projects and then someone finds out about these artists because of that project and gives them another opportunity, then like, I've literally done my job and what I've wanted to do. And, and that like means everything to me. So uh, that's, that's why I love doing this work primarily. Amazing. Do you have any other, uh, examples or projects coming up where you're kind of taking the, the digital world and kind of transforming it into real world experiences? I do have some really exciting projects coming up, uh, with the verse first actually. So, um, that like, I'm, I'm not going to like dive into too much because it's still like in the works, but you will see that and to me that's exciting and like a, a good op like a good example in the sense that they position themselves as a metaverse art gallery you know like making uh where where poem equals uh equals art um so it, it's really cool to not only work in the metaverse or digital space but also work with a bunch of poets in the literary space who are like turning poetry into visual art because of the blockchain so it that's another space that i'm super excited and passionate about i've been like like loving everything sasha styles for years now so to see the verse first and the entire team callan anna maria elizabeth like i'll just kill it is very exciting so i, I can't wait to like release these projects we're working on but um yeah i that is like a, a great example that's coming up i think other things that are good to kind of maybe point out from past projects like um we like when i uh i did a project with kadaf in um uh, for cause moscow art fair um when was it like i guess last september not this year but the year before before everything went crazy and Russia, which is another conversation, um, which then can lead me to <laughs> something else that I will talk about. But uh, that was a really great example of just getting a lot of the NFT art off the internet and into a physical space um, and to be able to like do a lot of workshopping and um, educational conversations and talks with groups of academics and like enthusiasts and uh, artists who 
really wanted at the time to continue to workshop through how we collect digital art like if nfts actually had like a longevity and like where the space would go and obviously we're still having a lot of these conversations but the conversation has shifted and um since even like last september so it's it's really interesting to kind of look back at those types of things um digital art month is also a super fun project to bring up another project we do with kadaf and uh it's basically an augmented reality art festival that we uh, where we take over a city for an entire month and have gigantic QR codes that link to augmented reality effects that are available on Instagram or um, Snapchat so that there's immediate public access, less barrier to entry, um, and also just a way to like interact with the public who might not even be like expecting a gigantic QR code or an art ex exhibition that day, but allows for us to interact and also bring like digital art into like the real world and show people like, again, various ways of displaying digital art and interacting with it. And um, yeah, I guess those are probably like some of my favorite examples. There are a few other things that are coming up, um, Miami projects, things like that. I nothing is ready to to be discussed fully, but I, I definitely like can't wait to show everyone. Um, I, maybe something I can talk about. I will be showing some art at the Kadath New York Art Fair in on November eleventh. So there's, that's a good example. We'll have um, some square 22 inch NFT screens that will have work on view. Um, I love getting uh, digital art like offline and onto screens or projectors or even printed for that matter. I love the idea of uh, just having um, a, a different place to view the work in, in a way where it's just like, oh, I can start to like see why or how this should be in my home or why this makes sense like outside of a screen. Uh, so anytime we get to do uh, exhibitions or showcases that are not just on your computer, I get very excited, but I, I also, you know, love an online exhibition. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I, I mean, definitely I love think them all. that. Oh, I definitely think that a lot of digital art is consumed just by scrolling on your phone totally. or looking online and it's just like goes by and it's like half a second in your in your vision or maybe you pause for a bit longer, but it's really nice when something can be in a space like a gallery exactly. and it gives you a moment to to like pause and really take it in. I couldn't agree more. That's literally yeah. Thank you for summarizing. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's so true. It really is. And um, I just love hearing about all the projects you were involved in. Honestly, like whenever I check in with you, you're always working on like a million really exciting things. So like that's, <laughs> I'm always so stoked to like touch base with you. Well, same. And, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> well, really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Well, my, my question, my next question for you was going to be about what, what are some of your favorite projects from the past few years? It's probably really hard to answer because I'm sure they're all really fun. But if you had to pick like two or three of your favorite projects, like what, what do you think they would be? Well, yeah, I, I mean, gosh, that's, that's hard. Everything I just met, I mentioned, I guess one thing that really stands out too that I haven't talked about is I, I got to do a local art project last summer in Buffalo, actually, um, with a public art program called Playground that's run by uh, the Beka Buffalo crew, as well as Resource Art or um, uh, uh, another local gallery. Um, that is, you know, around here and they really create a lot of great space for local artists, but then also just like that artists like nationally to kind of come in and uh, uh, create like a site specific work that is again, like physical, they're a contemporary, uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a contemporary art program. I, I brought digital art to the show. But it's awesome because they uh, are they get funding. They every artist gets a great um, honorarium to participate, and uh, it's an awesome like educational moment for the community that um, the surrounding towns and and the city of Buffalo really gets into. And so to be a part of that was really cool. Um, 
we, I worked with, um, who did I work with? Uh, Sasha Styles and uh, Diana Vandermeulen for that project. We did like um, a collaborative piece that was at the Broadway market. Um, a floor algorithm was uh, a piece that Sasha put forth. And then Diana had this beautiful kind of like very calming, um, meditative, like 2D environment um, that just like really kind of wowed this audience of people who I don't think have ever experienced work like that before. Um, we also had one of Diana's augmented reality effects. And so just watching like people in Broadway market, like interact with it was really, really special to me. So I am like really thankful for like local um, public art projects like that, that we can be a part of and that we can put work in and um, also just like reach like a, a very real and awesome audience who otherwise like wasn't looking for this work. But again, like maybe that changes, like, I don't know, like the, like what they're, their life looks like or what they want to do with their life like maybe that sparks like new creativity or new ideas to approach like what they're you know currently doing and and to me that's really exciting to then get those questions from kids and adults and be like what is this how do I make this like what how can I reach this artist like that is so special to me to just get these just very like natural and organic emotions that come from people who experience this work um, in real life and are excited about it and start to understand that, oh, whoa, this is like, you know, just as impactful as going into a museum and looking at a painting, you know, by, I don't know, Jackson Pollock or something like that. But otherwise, maybe I wouldn't do that because I don't want to go to a museum. So thank you for like, you know, getting me or meeting me where I am and showing me something that that like I can feel like it, it's for me and, and maybe helps kind of, um, again, like shape the way they think about how they can express themselves, which is to me, again, really special. So, yeah. That is That's really, really special. Yeah. Little side note, I actually, uh, Diana grew up across the street from ah. me. Ah, <laughs> that's so yeah. cute. It's such, and I was going to say, you know, uh, we were kind of in a similar group of friends when I was living in Toronto and because, you know, the art community when I was still living there, I don't know about now because it's been a while, but it was very tight knit and everyone kind of knew each other, even if you're working in different mediums. So yeah, it's such a small world. Yeah, I also worked with Miriam Arbus on that, um, project too. Uh, so she's in Toronto, amazing curator. So like, cool. I, I absolutely love working with them. It was very special. But I, yeah, I love that. It's That's really so amazing. Funny. Toronto, <laughs> yeah, it makes sense because yeah, not, not far from where I am. Yeah, everyone just knows everyone. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then another project that was super, super fun was um, the Christie's Education Courses um, that we did with Kadaf last, last year uh, on, you know, uh, understanding NFTs and with all the speakers who spoke about, you know, Web3 NFTs and digital art, it was really exciting to kind of like develop like a curriculum around um, these topics and, and put these short courses out there and, and see like the excitement from, again, just like very curious art students and collectors and just enthusiasts in general. So I'd say like, those are some of my, I mean, gosh, every project I do, I love. Like, I can't say there's any projects that I don't love. I love working with all the artists that we work with and the collaborators. And um, it's always, there's always something, like, super, super special. So it's it's hard to pick, but those are definitely some standout moments for me. Those sound do, great. Do you feel that the pandemic really per, perhaps, like, changed or kind of changed the direction of the projects you were working on or... Did you see, see it have an impact at all? Definitely. Like I went from like strictly doing public art projects and trying to find funding for public art projects to being able to actually specifically digital art projects, getting like digital art in in the like IRL spaces, but um, to to being able to like have the opportunity to work with artists to help them sell their work because all of a sudden there was this need to kind of like further explore digital art. The meeple sale happened. Don't even like, I like hate mentioning that at this point, but like that, you know, so many things happen to get us to where we are now. 
And I think the pandemic definitely accelerated that and allowed for a lot of people like myself to kind of like rethink the way that we um, work with digital art and like the way that we monetize. And um, I, I would say like back then, like, oh gosh, we did, we were working on the one Times Square metaverse project um, for New Year's Eve um, during the pandemic. And it was before the Beeple sale. Again, I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, and I had to beg them basically (laughs) to like, let us do digital artworks like in the space. And it was just what made the most sense to me as a curator, because we're, we're creating, like, we're putting art in the metaverse. It's, that's native to the space. Like, why wouldn't we do digital art? And, um, so anyway, uh, right after that project happened, you know, like the NFT space just like blew up and every single artist in that show or most artists in that show are now like a huge NFT artist. So it was just like really interesting, but there was just definitely a massive shift between, um, the way, like, like the, the way I would pitch a brand then to now, um, or, or not a brand, I should say like a space, to really like consider creating more room for digital art because it, again we were just very much culturally in a different kind of conversation and space and I think there's a lot of people looking at digital art obviously there's been a lot of uh extremely dedicated people <laughs> in this space for a long time don't want to take anything away from that but when it came to the majority of projects that were happening and that were being funded um it wasn't like it prominently digital art projects so like it's you know massively changed then all of a sudden nft nyc happened and like the entirety of times square in real life was full of digital art so it's just like night I love day that. crazy shift um and yeah so the pandemic accelerated the heck out of this and my entire business model definitely changed we went more from an agency model to a gallery model hybrid kind of situation and um yeah a lot more opportunity happened and I don't know I think like if you look at the artists that I've worked with over time like I don't even have to say anything like it's like the the trajectory and the path is like there and it's clear and you know um it's exciting it's very very uh, exciting for um those who were able to like do really well because of what's happened although the pandemic is obviously like super tragic but this was definitely something good that came out of it i think but time yeah definitely i mean i can really relate to what you're saying it was a really big year for me as an artist you know although i was very scared and the pandemic was awful but it's good that there was a little bit of a silver lining for digital art and you know, it somehow happened to be the year that digital artists were able to like really accelerate their work. And, you know, people started to kind of respect that medium a lot more than exactly. Before. Yeah. So um, I want to go back a little bit and talk about the um, actual, you talked about this before, but I would like to go over the art month, digital art month in New York, because I think that may be how we met is um, I had an augmented reality yes. piece in that exhibition in the Meatpacking District. So I would just love to hear more about um, how you came up with that concept and how you decided like which piece goes where, because it was just such a cool experience. Totally. I mean, that's definitely like a very like precious project. I Digital Art Month, um, especially when we launched that, was at a time when like we all needed like some reprieve or some just like way to get outside and like feel like ourselves again and and breathe um amid like the atrocities that were happening with COVID and and just you know the not knowing what was going to happen so um Kadaf approached me about um an art festival that they wanted to develop and my suggestion was augmented reality and so that kind of like worked that that is what kind of like sparked the larger idea around turning the entire art festival that we then decided to call digital art month um into a full-blown like augmented reality festival um and for so many reasons but mainly like at the time everybody was 
uh, starting to, you know, embrace QR codes because it felt safe and restaurants were using them, everyone was using them. So again, if you meet people where they're at, it again makes it easier to engage with a larger audience and a public audience who then can know what to do with like what you're putting out there. So um, we got together and uh, worked with various um uh, you know, uh, branded or uh, what are they called? Bids, um, business improvement districts and things like that in public spaces to allow us to have access to, um, various like flag poles, um, you know, uh, A-frame signs, um, just space within like their lo- like neighborhoods to then erect like X amount of like digital art, um, uh, you know, um, exhibits or installations throughout the city for the, in whatever month we were doing it. I guess the first one was in October, I want to say of 2020, um, I believe. And, uh, yeah, the, we, we did an open call for that. We also invited artists for that. And the goal was to make it feel as site specific as possible. Um, and so to kind of like get artists to really consider, um, what they wanted to submit and why and like where they wanted it to exist. So it was very collaborative for the most part. Um, Some artists just wanted to put forth something that they wanted to share. And in that case, we were more kind of, um, uh, we would look at the work, look at what it meant and put it in a neighborhood that made sense. Uh, But we just really wanted to give back to the artist community, but also like do something nice for the public and get everybody feeling you know as well as can be for a moment in time like even if just for like an hour or like or 30 minutes on their way to work and just stopping and like doing something that felt like it could just distract them or bring them back to like normal life for a second um was like huge but also take time to smell the roses and like rethink and or re-experience your surrounding environment which is what I think augmented reality really allows one to do it's just oftentimes we're we're you know on um this whole kind of like uh robotic sort of track to get to one place to the next every day because it's our routine that's what we do and we forget to like look up or we forget to look around we forget to see things and and so I think um that art uh public art specifically allows you to re-experience your common space and reappreciate it maybe or see something new about it and um reaffirm your love for your city and your environment and anything else that needs to kind of like come up for you specifically. So it was just for us, like really, really important to, um, create something that was like, felt like also endless, um, in a sense, cause we had, gosh, like, I want to say the first one, we had like 60 plus augmented reality effects. So you could spend like every weekend experiencing digital art month and like still not get through all of the AR effects. So it was really cool to like work on that project, work with the artists, um, kind of collaborate to, to better understand like where, what location worked for that specific artwork. Uh, and then, I mean, we got, as we got deeper into this project, we started becoming even more thematic. The last digital art month we had in Paris, um, in June, uh, had the theme of no war in support of Ukraine. And the artwork that was specifically created for that was absolutely stunning, absolutely beautiful, so incredibly touching to see the like larger community come together in support um, and express their grief, you know, and and also help people express their grief and and understand what was going on and, and do everything they can to like demand an end to war because what the heck, like. <laughs> what the heck. So anyway, that was a really, really beautiful project. And, um, each artist, uh, again, really like just melted my heart. Like I I can't even express that more. It was, it was just so beautiful. So it's been an exciting journey to do that. And, um, 
to work in different, you know, areas and, and to have all these different partners who really support like the projects and what we, we do. And, and that to me was everything, you know, again, like coming together as we are to like do what is important to us and to hopefully speak to others and, and, and help them like, you know, do whatever they need to do to smile or like grieve or whatever it is, because again, art is super powerful and, and again, I'm not saying that all art is about that. All art isn't about like helping with that. Some artists have very different agendas, but I think when you're putting art in a public space, you you do get an even more subjective sort of like approach or outlook from the public because it you can't control that audience. Like you can't, you don't, like that's the beautiful thing about it. it you don't know who is going to experience it, period and how it's going to affect them. Um, so for me, these projects are super cool. And uh, yeah, the contributions are awesome. And, and, and the artists who decide to create this work and, and are brave enough to put their work out there and allow for that to happen is also like huge too. So I also want to mention that because it's scary to have people look at your work and, and judge and or think what they want to think about it. Like that's a big deal. So it's, again, really inspiring um, to see that happen. It is, yeah. So beautiful. Okay, so we already went over this quite a, <laughs> a few times, kind of, but I think it's important to really touch on specifically is um, maybe you could talk a bit about how you see Web3 and blockchain empowering artists and creators. Yeah, I mean, gosh, Web3, blockchain, every like where we're going to me is huge because again, even more so than Web2 or what we thought Web2 might do with social media for the artists, like Web3 actually puts way more control back into the artist's hands. Yes, like in the beginning, there was this thought that maybe the artists didn't need a gallery or a curator or any of those things to, you know, exist now because of NFTs and all of the... Um, agency that they you know had access to because of this burgeoning space if, if you can call it that I mean it's been around for a good amount of time now but still um but I, I also think it allowed artists to maybe regain some control with how they like deliberately or like um uh more thoughtfully work with the collaborators that they work with um it, rather than you know have to meet like gatekeepers and galleries and others where they are, they could really kind of more so um, create boundaries or like, you know, um, not, I don't want to say rules, but just some like better ways of working with people that made more sense for them, who they are as artists and also allow all of us to appreciate each other more too, in a way, because we could be more thoughtful at the end of the day. And it's like, artists realizing that curators are really important. Like we need to help contextualize the work. We need to help like sift through <laughs> the open sea and the rareable and all of these different platforms that are out there because, you know, really like in a matter of like, you know, moments, the space became so oversaturated with work. It's like, how, how do you actually connect with collectors? Things like that. Um, why galleries are important. Why, you know, getting extra help with marketing and all of these things are important. Um, and, and also being able to potentially, you know, get your work out there, build an audience and then reconnect with maybe a gallery that otherwise wasn't accessible to you in the past. Like I think blockchain has really helped with that. Um, but also specifically for the, the digital artists, blockchain has been everything because provenance is everything right for a collector and selling that work so before this it's like most of the artists i worked with weren't, weren't selling their art they didn't have collectors for it um there was no understanding of like how to own a file or there wasn't a huge comfort level around that when it came to a larger like mass audience um yes it was still happening <laughs> like a lot of other curators who have been in this game a lot longer would probably be like wrong, Jessica. But in this case, like for me and the artist I was working on in the space that I was existing in, 
this wasn't like how, you know, the artist and myself were, were earning money. Like it wasn't really like a thing at prior to, you know, being able to get on to NFT platforms and make your work and, and uh, show your work and so on and so forth. So just being able to um, create ownership for a collector to better understand um, that this work now is in your wallet. It belongs to you based on like how the artist, you know, wrote the smart contract, so on and so forth. Like for, for, you know, myself and everyone I work with became like, again, like a huge moment of, of just, you know, reevaluating careers and better understanding like how to be a digital artist today and how to um, exist more traditionally if you want to because of block the blockchain, but then also getting like super experimental and crazy because you can do a lot of things. Um, it, the blockchain, a smart contract, they could act as a medium as well. And like, there's so many interesting things to consider there. Um, so, so yeah, like I, I, I um, at this moment in time, like my outlook on the state of digital art and where it's going is um, much, m much more optimistic. It's always been very optimistic, but it's, it's even more so optimistic than I could have imagined like in the past. And so, yeah, that's. Hey, I totally, yeah, I really know what you mean. And I mean, personally, Web3 has really empowered me as an artist and uh, facilitated so many new opportunities. So it's been such an interesting journey. And um, I would love to hear your thoughts. Like, do you feel that Web3 can empower creators from marginalized groups in developing countries? Oh, absolutely. I mean, gosh, um, an artist that you could call out for that, um, who everybody, you know, maybe would speak about and who would also speak about this from his own point of view would be like Osanachi. And it's just like how a lot of artists became like more prominent um, because of the NFT space, because of the Web3 space in places that didn't have as many resources for them to get their work out there. So I absolutely think that this is the place for artists to um, uh, be able to have more opportunity, especially um, uh, if they're not in a place that would usually allow for that. However, there's a lot of work to be done because there's still um, a lot more, you know, male artists uh, than female artists. And there's a lot of diversity that needs to still happen. Um, a lot of platforms, I don't know, like it would be interesting to see like how many female artists versus male artists they actually have like I, I would be curious to look at that I think um you know I I like to be I'm a positive person so I like to focus on positives but uh I I would say that like we 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 have our work cut out for us because what I've seen in the metaverse and what I've seen in the NFT space is a lot of like repeating like the same problems that we already had prior to blockchain happening. Yes, there's like a lot of opportunity to do better, but we do have to like work towards that and discover like what that means collectively. Um, I know a lot of platforms are like making major strides and making this happen. Um, and this is, a you know, another one of the reasons why like projects like Women of the World, um, are really important to me and something that I'd like to focus more on, you know, almost exclusively because, uh, you know, certain people definitely need more help and I, I want to acknowledge that and be there for that specifically. That's beautiful. Really beautifully said. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. Um, yeah, we were also curious you know, what is your opinion of Web3 and digital, like the future of Web3 and digital art? And if you could take like a really wild guess, you know, where do you see this? How do you see it affecting the art world in the next like five or 10 years? Well, okay. I mean, this is, I like, I always suck at these answering these questions, this specific type of question, but I will 
say that um, Web3, uh, I don't know if we're quite there yet. We have a, a long way to go. I, I think we might be at like 2.8 like something or maybe not even, but you know, we're still figuring out what that means. Um, again, there's more other people out there that would probably be able to like speak to that more than myself um, as I'm really here to facilitate what artists want to do and what they're doing and, and like really helping to support that like in the here and now, but also help evolve that. But I would say um, that, you know, just like social media, <laughs> it was just like something that like people were reluctant to do, but we eventually all did it. Like Web3 is going to be something that we all have to adapt to. We all have to figure out like connecting your wallet is going to be potentially like very normal. I mean, Instagram just rolled out like collectibles. Uh, so that uh, creates like a whole nother wave of like awareness or like there's like, I think 1.4 million people that are on Instagram that haven't interacted with crypto art before that are now going to have access to that. So it's just, there's like a lot of interesting things happening. Um, I think you, like, you know, the fact that uh, institutions, for example, like the AKG Museum in Buffalo, who are working towards, you know, NFT auctions and things like that, and other museums, um, uh, are really kind of, you know, creating almost like context clues for the future and like what that's going to look like. So I do really believe that all galleries are going to somehow adapt to this kind of opportunity of having NFTs available as a way for collectors to collect art in general, if not just for provenance purposes. It does solve for a lot of issues, um, period. Even if you look at like, actually won't go down that path because it's not my specialty, but like institution or whatever, like blockchain is huge for things like that. So I just think it's going to become just like normal <laughs> to like mint your work or maybe mint you know, your, your medical records or whatever, like there's, everything is going to be on the blockchain. Um, so I don't think it's going to be as like, I, I don't, like, I don't think we'll be talking about it as much, honestly, it's just going to be something that we do. Um, I also just think everything is going to be more integrated with the metaverse. I think we're going to like slowly learn how to exist in both places more and more, which will make the world smaller <laughs> because that might be the better, like the more accessible space for travel without traveling, without buying plane tickets, things like that. Um, I think, gosh, um, hmm. I think that we're all going to just, you know, have a foothold in the real world, in the metaverse. We're all going to have NFTs in our wallet of some sort and, um, that blockchain is going to be something that everyone has adapted to in some way, shape or form to maintain records, period. Um, Sounds like a pretty good future to me. <laughs> not very imaginative. <laughs> like, yeah. No, I'll take it. Hey. Sorry. Yeah, we that had a friend, friend recently saying how uh, he even mints like travel photos and then we'll just send them to his friends. Yeah, cool. Because then like they're never going to lose that. Yeah. It's always, always going to exist. That's right? huge. Instead of, yeah. Yeah, so I love the last, practical. Yeah. Oh. The last question, something that everyone's been talking about a lot lately is just how do you feel that AI is going to affect the art world? I like today and in the future. I love this question. And, and yeah, I will try mm -hmm. to keep it to the art world because I, I my okay. brain starts to go everywhere else. But like... Um, no problem. Yeah, no, AI is huge. I think it's super, super awesome. I'll be super curious to see like how actually that does um, affect the art world specifically. But the fact that so many artists are now playing around with, you know, AI and G like GPT-3 or um, Dolly... Whoops, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to be able to like remember all of the platforms right now. I'm sorry. There's a lot. There's so many of them. But there's so many. Um, yeah. And I I literally feel like every other day some artist tells me about another like AI platform or tool that they're using to create either like um, uh, videos or 
like JPEGs or whatever they're doing. I, I think it's very interesting because I think it's just like going to become more and more, again, normal for artists to like utilize AI technology. I love GPT-3. Again, I love everything the verse first, uh, Sasha Styles. Um, everyone who's working in that space or doing with AI. Um, I think that co-authoring uh, work with AIs also allows for us to be that much more imaginative because we have access to massive databases that otherwise like wouldn't be available at our fingertips. Like that would be so much work to research and to understand and to collect and so on and so forth. And I know like a lot of artists are also using their own resource materials, but when you have access to everything on the internet through, you know, an AI platform and can really tap into just, you know, finessing the way that you prompt an AI to create something, it'll be really cool to see what people come up with. I mean, uh, a lot of the art that I've been seeing um, that's AI based is becoming even like, like, I guess just more and more specific, like it's less abstract and it's super cool to see what artists are coming up with. Um, uh, I, I think it's going to be way more mainstream. I think there's going to be tons of apps <laughs> that just like everybody use. I think it's going to be the future of just content in general. Um, but for the art world specifically, I think it's just we'll see a, a lot more um, AI artists uh, represented in, in all different like in different galleries and, and things It won't be as like, um, uh, I, I don't ever want to say it's like taboo. I think a lot of people there was a lot of controversy initially around like whether or not utilizing an AI was actually, you know, artistic and I think we saw that with, what was it, the Christie's auction um, that happened a while back. And I think we've gone past that at this point now with AI, um, because again, like it's all about what you ask for and it takes a human to figure that out at this point anyway, but you know, maybe the computer, um, I mean, again, it depends on the artist too, because then we'll look at other artists who create AIs that then are running and doing their own entirely, like, own thing. Um, I mean, look at, like, LaTurbo Avedon and, like, some of the other AI artists that are, um, super prominent. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know, like, I, I think, like, I, I wish I could be more imaginative right now for you guys, but I am just thinking that, um, I would have to, I like literally, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that there's just going to be a lot more creativity and things that we can't even imagine will happen because of AI, but it also, again, will just be normal. Like I think of it as like the calculator, right? Like it'll be something that we use that will not, no longer be this thing that people think is like cheating. Um, it's like, it's just going to be like, yes, of course I use this tool. Of course I use Jasper AI to like write a blog post or like, you know, I guess something that's personal and that I can actually speak to is as a curator, I have been using AI to co-author my curatorial statements lately. I've been playing around with that because why not? Um, to me, that's super interesting and I'm getting a lot more done, but also, um, able to be more and more creative with my work because of that. And I feel like it really kind of is um, very complementary to the work that the artists are doing too, because the whole entire thing becomes one thing, like our project and experimentation because of that. So um, on a personal level or like a career level, that's how I'm like leveraging AI. And I think that more and more people um, are, are doing that and should do that. A lot of artists are working to write books with GPT-3, things like that, which is super cool. I'm learning more about GPT-3 personally too, because again, I just think that this is a tool that a lot of art world professionals, even if you're not an artist, should really kind of like start to grasp and understand and utilize because it does provide um, very new ways to, to get your work done, which is cool. One thing I've been finding really interesting is I think that it's being uh, accepted 
much quicker than other technologies were. Like that even when people started started using drum machines, and it took like fifteen years <laughs> or something before people accepted the fact that it was music, and they were like, they're just pressing buttons; they're not actually making <laughs> yeah, anything. And same with um, when people started using Photoshop and stuff, people were like, oh, it's not really art; they're just doing it in the computer. Yeah. And now you're like, well, I had an AI generate this whole thing, and people are like, oh, it's, it's art; like, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's actually. <laughs> So that's oh, nice that's to see, yeah. Because that's been the biggest yeah. problem with every single medium that's like birthed itself into this world, right? Throughout history, like no one's wanted to accept it. It's taken so long. So the fact that you are making that suggestion, or you're noticing, or observing that, is is kind of like a big step forward for the entirety of, of yeah. the art world, historically yeah. speaking. Um, so that's cool. Absolutely, I like that. Thanks, Aaron. Great insight. Yeah, really good insight. I love that people are becoming more open-minded yeah. like that. It's cool. Maybe the NFT space has helped us with that. Maybe Web3. Yeah. I think people are starting to be like, oh, I the metaverse, so. everything. Okay, like, why not, you know? Yeah. Now AI. Okay, okay why, why not? not? Bring it on. <laughs> sure. It's the future, yeah. you know. There's no turning back. Yeah. Although, let's let's be mindful of how long these things have been around and how long it's taken us to actually have these conversations because um, even the term, the metaverse comes from the past, like snow crash. So yeah. this is actually, yeah. this is all so slow. True. This, none of this is fast. This is very slow. We just feel like it's fast. So 